for the um, the bow fiddle project, ranch project. So this is a project that came up with uh, uh, a landowner named Joe Leininger. Uh, he was uh, he works for a large investment company, and he bought this ranch in southern Wyoming. And uh, as a river shared group, we were kind of starting out, we were more of an idea than a nonprofit at the time. Uh, but we had known Joe, Joe from working on a project uh, with Stantec back in 2014 in um, Nigeria Creek in Southern Route County, Colorado. Uh, working for resource land holdings. And uh, so Joe had come and said, hey, I need some help on this ranch. Uh, and what he wanted to do is, uh, the problem was, if you can see the red line on the screen, um, there was an agricultural field. The river started to laterally migrate and erode. And then all the flood flows started to pass in the field and create a side channel that was abandoned in the Little Laramie River. And on the Little Laramie River, he had really good fishing, and that's what he concerned himself with a bunch. He wanted the fishing on the Little Laramie River, and the water started to create a new channel in the banks on the floodplain of the Little Laramie River, where there was no uh, vegetation nearby. Uh, and there was some good short-term fish habitat in there, but long-term, there was gonna be some problems. So we looked at this, and he just, he wanted to fix a bank. Uh, and do nothing else to the river, but we noticed that there was fairly significant uh, up valley meander migration that was occurring on the thing. We had side channel uh, concerns uh, where water was getting into the side channel at high flows. We saw at a bank full flow, we saw over 60% of the water going into the uh, side erosional channel and the avulsion, uh, and then the water would rush down by the 130 bridge and get back into the Little Laramie River. So uh, Wyoming DOT was having some issues with it as well because you're having scour right up against the embankment fill for the bridge. So they had some issues with grazing and pasture management as well. So what we had done and what I want to go over here is one to talk a little bit about the, the grant project and what we could be doing with some river shared things in the future. And then the other thing is just to talk about managing a client's expectations a little bit. So, so we had this channel that was starting to form. And as it was starting to form, we saw that there was less and less water in the Laramie River, uh, which was negative for fish habitat um, in the short term. So we came up with a restoration idea. We worked with the US Fish and Wildlife Service, Wyoming, uh, Fish and Game Department, Trout Unlimited. Um, and in that, we created a series of oxbow ponds. Um, and we were trying to realign a section of the river in different locations so that uh, we could keep sediment moving through the area and also be able to stabilize the banks. So we didn't want to see this up valley meander migration where we we're going to have a lot of sediment deposit out. We wanted to keep the energy high to move the sediment through this area and then be able to put in some plugs and have the channel fill back in. So we came up with an estimated cost and we used an MCDA as we discussed before, multi-criteria decision analysis tool. And uh, we had a project that the landowner wanted to pay about $60,000 for and it ended up costing $320,000. So we looked at some potential funding opportunities um, and one of the funding opportunities that came up um, after laying out our goals and objectives uh, was, well, maybe we can look at a WWNRT grant. WWNRT grant is uh, Wyoming, uh, WW, Wyoming Wildlife National Resource Trust Fund. Uh, so essentially this is money that's uh, run at the state level but it's being paid into by uh, oil and energy development. And then they have this fund that you apply for and it's supposed to improve wildlife in different areas. Uh, it's generally meant for um, more public wildlife and this was private wildlife. So that was one of our first issues we got to with this. But our goals 
I won't go over all the objectives because it's not the intent of this project to go over all the objectives, but the goals were uh, fish and habitat improvement, land management, and conservation, um, uh, river morphology stability, and wildlife habitat. Um, the WWNRT, um, we had to justify there was a public benefit for them to get that. And basically what we showed is the effects of the restoration, the stream and wetland restoration would have on downstream um, as well as a potential for uh, uh, fish habitat improvement, which would affect the downstream fishery as well. And then uh, protection of the Highway 130 bridge. So after we did that, we found out that we uh, could go after this grant for the private landowner because of the public benefits downstream. And then we teamed with a local conservation district, um, the Laramie Rivers Conservation District. And then uh, with that team and partner, we applied for WWRT. We also worked with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and Mindy Mead, and she helped find some small funds. And then we used uh, design fees uh, from RiverShared, which meant that we had uh, people working in RiverShared that went out and volunteered their time, and then we had to show this part of the match. Um, so we were able to get the project uh, funded through that and allow the landowner to pay $60,000, which was a pretty good match for these grants. And then we were able to do a project for $320,000 uh, after we got all the other grants together. So that was a pretty neat project. It was the first river shared uh, grant project that we were able to use river shared funds as a grant match. Now that was before river shared was an official nonprofit. Uh, since March, Dave Geenan has uh, worked with Brad Fairley and others and have been able to create river share as a nonprofit. So uh, it's a little bit easier now. We actually have another project we worked on this weekend in South Dakota uh, where uh, Greg Tyak, Ken Lai and myself uh, and Andrea Tyak uh, volunteered time to go up and work on a river share project uh, to work on design. So, so that's the whole idea. Now, this is just an example, and I think a lot of people on the call have heard this before uh, and have been in the same situation, but what happens right after construction when you get a bigger than bankful event? Uh, and how do people look at these projects and how do we manage a client's expectations? So the Bill of Fiddle project, right after construction, they had 1,200 CFS and the um, project was, was designed uh, so the 1,200 CFS was above the bankful stage. Um, I believe our bankful stage was around 700 CFS. So we started, this was on a road where a lot of people drove by on 130. So some of our stakeholders would drive by the road and they saw water flooding and they were pretty sure that the whole thing just blew out at high flows because water's flowing uh, on the side channel and hasn't, you know, didn't stay in the old channel. So as people do, as uh, uh, homo sapiens have uh, uniquely done, they uh, gossip and they start to talk to each other and tell everybody how the project's not working, look what's going next to the road. So it takes a couple of weeks for everything to get back to myself and the team. By the time that it got back to me, it was a whisper down the lane and um, the whole project that sounded like it failed and there's a, uh, a complete and utter waste of money and there's no reason we should have ever done this project. <laughs> um, so I think we've probably heard some, we've heard of these before. So, um, so we went out last year to look at this and uh, our summaries uh, are, are, you know, we looked at it last year and then our summaries to what to do we came up with and then we actually did nothing uh, because nobody kind of got around to the maintenance sins. And then I went back out there this week. And this week, uh, even the kind of the long and sh short term repair suggestions, the long term repair su suggestions, none of them look like they need to be done. And of course, we didn't do any short term repair, uh, repair suggestions. So, um, so we'll go through some of these examples. So, um, 
one of the big concerns that they saw when the water came down is we had some sod transplants and sod transplants came out to the banks. Um, and it's right near where the plug location was supposed to be for this river. Um, and it's one of those things where it looked, definitely looked ugly. What we've seen this year, one year later, is we probably have 100,000 uh, small willows that have germinated in that area. Uh, so now we start to see this natural revegetation of uh, plant source from upstream. And we were seeing live stakes. There were some concerns about live stakes. You know, they looked at the stakes and didn't think they were alive because they're just like sticks out of the ground. Of course, this, we saw a little bit of growth off the live stakes and the land. We told the landowner, well, there just needs to be a little bit of growth. This goes back to the idea of the uh, branches and the vine. It just needs to be a little bit of growth. And this year, of course, we see a lot more growth. So um, part, of, part of the idea for this landowner was just saying, hey, let's have a little bit of patience. And, you know, we're still here. We're still listening to you. We're not going to run away. Uh, but let's just see how this whole thing works out. Uh, this is where we had the big plug to separate the side channel that had formed from the Little Laramie River. And... We had really poor revegetation on here because of floods and the de deposited material. Um, and last week when I went out there, uh, this is all colonized with small willows and uh, sedges and juncus. Uh, so, and this was designed for at 600 CFS. Um, we were supposed to see flood flow. So we had about two times bank full right after construction. Um, we saw a little bit of scour right after construction in some of the, some of the fill downstream. Uh, but at this point, you can see that you have some coarser material, some fire material. Uh, we weren't really concerned about that. We figured the grow, vegetation would grow back, and that's what it has definitely done. You can't tell the scour this year uh, when, we were, when I went out there. Uh, we, had, we had lost one tree on the outside of the meander bend. Um, they had graded into the bank. And this is in a place where we uh, realigned the river and we had one cotton where they wanted to keep and it fell down. Um, but this is one of the places where it's making excellent fish habitat now and there was no reason to move it for the goals and objectives of the project, which is to move sediment downstream to stabilize the overflow channel so the overflow channel does not become the main channel. This is okay. And it's this year it showed it being a really good habitat as well. Um, so overall, when we looked at the project, uh, I went out to the site and I was told this site's horrible, it's all failed. And we had three phone calls before I could get out to the site because of traveling and weather and everything else. And everybody was super angry about this project. Um, went out to the site, I looked at it and it seemed to be exactly where I thought it wanted to be. Um, so, you know, we we had this project that we were blessed with being able to help the group get a grant um, application put together for. And with, with the grant application, uh, when they put this together, uh, River shared had been a large portion of that grant application. Uh, we put together a design, we communicated to the other stakeholders. Uh, we thought everybody understood it. We used an MCDA, uh, but then it came out that people didn't exactly understand what the project should look like afterwards. And we found ourselves in communication with them to help teach them what it should look like. Now, um, I say this not as a means of Oh, well, those silly people type of thing. I say it's just to kind of be an encouragement to, to other people on the line. Uh, there's a lot of times that we jump out to fix a project before we need to go out to fix a project because uh, we're trying to control a situation uh, in communication more than we even are trying to put the river back on the right trajectory. So a lot of times we have a river that we put on the correct trajectory. And this is a simple project because, you know, it took a stream that was having problems with sediment deposition uh, 
and no vegetation on a bank that then caused a side channel um, and it, it strained it out it increased sediment transport significantly and it created a big riparian buffer area that was planted to regrow stuff so it's a pretty easy fix but yet you know we we're still at a point where uh, and I know and it wasn't it's not a difficult one for me to look at and say okay well I can understand this one but yet I still found myself um, almost wanting to go out there and fix something the first year after construction that didn't need to be fixed just because of the fact that I was trying to manage the expectations and the aggression that was being shown by different stakeholders. Uh, so I think it's, it's, I say this as an encouragement to is to say sometimes let's stand our ground and encourage stakeholders to have patience um, instead of jumping out to fix something that doesn't need to be fixed yet. Um, this is one of the uh, ponds that we did. Uh, and these are spring fed ponds, they're beautiful ponds. Um, but you can see all that woody debris in the forefront of the picture. That woody debris came in through post flood, uh, through flood debris. Uh, and because we had these big storms, uh, right after construction, we had all this flood debris that got up on there and basically filled in around the bottom of these ponds and it embedded wood and logs into places that they wouldn't have otherwise been. Uh, it also encouraged the creation of some beaver dams on these ponds, which raised the stage in these ponds. Um, and on the margins, because the stages were raised, it created this nursery habitat uh, where we saw trout fry last year and this year we saw a whole bunch of trout fry we had this big complexity and instead of being a big hole in the ground for a pond we end up having this very complex fringe around it now that can serve as a good nursery habitat uh, so what i would say is if we would have went out there and cleared out everything after the big flood and tried to fix everything uh, part of our fixing of this project was just allowing a big flood to come through uh, and then having patience to watch how the channel recovers and how the oxbows recover. But the complexity of this project, and this, and we went back out there this year, and this project continued to get better this year uh, with another year uh, and became just a more complex uh, habitat and ecosystem uh, in the next year. And, you know, we have beavers out this year, we had beavers out there. So we're looking at the downstream section and decide, okay, well, do we want to leave the beaver dams for this year? Uh, or come back out next year and the beaver dams are far enough downstream on the channel uh, my thoughts are well we might just leave them here for this year they're not going to affect the sediment transport they're not going to affect the establishment of vegetation as uh, beaver dams are natural so there's no reason to come out and rip out a beaver dam if we don't need to so that was that's kind of the bow fiddle uh, project um, we had some minor a scour for overflow. We designed the overflow ramps uh, to be below 1.5 pounds per square foot at the 100 year discharge. We did not get a 100 year discharge. We got about a five to 10 year discharge. And um, we saw a little bit of scour, but it was also right after construction before we had vegetation grown. Uh, we didn't do anything to fix it. We just kind of let it be. Uh, and it's we went out there this year and the whole veg is has greened up and we don't have any problems with it now. We'll be, it'll be fine for providing resistance against that 1.5 pounds per square foot uh, design criteria. So with that, uh, that was the Bowfiddle project. And uh, we have, if I'll open up some questions, I think what we're gonna be doing is um, we'll be doing a structure uh, the second week, the third weeks we'll be doing a a project to kind of learn from and then probably the fourth week we'll be doing a new process uh, and then we'll just the, the first week of every month we'll just have some sort of random thing that goes on so we're going to try to the third week of every month I'm going to be trying to uh, sh have somebody share a project and lesson learned from that project so Dave, it's Brad. Um, interesting talk. I, I guess my, my question is, 
Have we learned anything in terms of how to manage expectations beforehand? Is it, is it like, would it be worth giving this talk to another project proponent to help them understand that, you know, everybody freaks out when something happens and everybody thinks it's not working when in fact, if you just be patient, it all comes around. Um, is there a value in doing something to try and manage uh, expectations before we go to construction so that people don't freak out and jump to conclusions? I, I think there is, Brad. I'm going to open up to other people on the line and see if they've found ways of doing that because I haven't yet. I mean, I still have have some clients that just seem – and, uh, you know, Joe Leininger is a good friend, and he was a friend yeah. when he did the project, so I, I – I, it's not like he didn't like us or anything. And he even told us when he thought it was failing, he's like, I really like you, Dave, but this is failing. Uh, so I'll open that up to the rest of the group to, to, to see if anybody else has any comments. I don't, so. Hey, Dave. Yeah, Alan. Al, uh, we've experienced uh, plenty of the same stuff in North Carolina working with folks too. And um, what we've, made a little bit of attempt to do um, in the last few months is that our pre-construction meeting with a lot of the stakeholders and try, you know, obviously with the landowner and the folks over there, but um, on the very kind of last page after we go through some of that, um, we listed down a few things of just what to expect. And one of the things that that we have listed down is expect a large runoff event <laughs> either during <laughs> construction or immediately following construction. And, uh, you know, it's going to look vulnerable. There may be some areas that may need to be addressed, but this is all natural. And uh, trying to get folks away from this expectation that if we come out there and make a, a repair or do some restoration stabilization on a project that was unstable to begin with, um, to think that there's not going to be areas along there that are going to adjust and do things over time is just unrealistic expectations. I think having that conversation maybe early and often with people is, uh, is needed. You know, we've got several allies with soil water districts and others that seem to have this false impression that when you go out there to address a project like this, once you fix it, it's going to look like that from now on. And, you, and they really don't hold any other, and I will call this conservation, stabilization, stewardship activity to the same level of expectation. You know, people build grass waterways or diversions all the time that have a runoff event and get washed out a little bit and they reseed them and, it, and it, it's, you know, hey, that's okay. But, um, I'm not sure how we can uh, get beyond some of this unless we just continually keep talking about it, that expect adjustments over time. This is going to change. We're in a dynamic system. That's what it's got to be. But um, we've got a little sheet that's got that listed on it, along with a, a checklist of, you know, some of the other stuff that you would typically talk about in pre-construction and have the you know, the participants sign off on that, that they understand that. So we'll see <laughs> how that's working, but we've just implemented that in the last little bit. So is Joe happier now, Dave? Oh yeah, Joe's great. Yeah, he, yeah, we, we, he was, uh, he, the nice thing about Joe is he kind of, you know, because he's a friend, you know, he trusted, trust me that he goes, I don't think this is going the way I want it, but he's like, I, I trust you. So that was good. And so it's, it, you know, sometimes you have just a mistrust that's there uh, opposed to kind of a mistrust or just questions and having mistrust and questions is a lot harder than just having questions. Uh, so he's, yeah, he's, he's good now. And his project, I mean, his project looks amazing. Uh, he's going to be doing more work. He has an open permit uh, on his ranch. He has, this is a weird thing for Wyoming. Uh, Eric Haggard of the state of Wyoming asked us to put together what he calls a watershed um, uh, nationwide 27 permit. 
Uh, basically what that means is that I could just identify the stream and say these are the projects that we could potentially do in the streams and these are the processes we're going to follow and he'll approve the entire permit for the ranch uh, and then in the future if we have another project we want to do that follows those rules or guidelines uh, he told us to just turn it in on 30 days uh, and if he doesn't if we don't hear back it's approved uh, so it's a very unique opportunity for this guy's ranch because the state wanted to do a different type of permit than what they normally do. Uh, so Joe will be doing some more work and he's excited about that. So Interesting. Hey, Alan, this is Mike. Um, I, I think it's a great idea to be doing that, having that conversation prior to construction. And one of the things that I've come in banging around in my head is some sort of a of an illustrated graphic that conveys the point that, you know, in terms of resilience or ability to respond to a change in conditions, you know, we're at our weakest point the day we walk off the site. And as time goes on, the strength of the system and its ability to respond in a more predictable way is increases. And so maybe, maybe that's something I can get to you or anybody else in the call for that matter, um, get some feedback and maybe put together a useful graphic that kind of conveys that message maybe in a cartoon fashion or something like that. Um, just, so that's, just so that's in everybody's mind that, that that's out there. Yeah, I, that, that's a great idea because, you know, uh, pictures speak volumes to people that they can see that. And I almost think, you know, something graphically that kind of explains and what you just said, when we walk off the site, that is the absolutely the most vulnerable we are. And being able to communicate that with some kind of graphic or picture uh, and showing the strength of the that grows and matures is a great idea. What about a video? So like one of our municipal clients deals with lots of property owners and we have these issues of expectations. So uh, his idea is to keep capturing these videos. And, well, actually he's using like uh, still motion uh, and when you look at them fast, they look like a video. But um, he's capturing, you know, the whole process year one and, and aiming toward, you know, once the project's done and they get their, they get their, you know, their, their ryegrass all shows up in the upland, you know, on the overbank area. Sometimes you get, you don't have the ideal veg mix, but everyone gets excited and they start to mow the grass in their backyard and. <laughs> and then when the vegetation starts to move in, you got to go back and tell them to back off. But anyway, yes, uh, like you guys are saying, a graphic would be nice. But some, what about if Rivershare did like a small video uh, of what to expect? You know, if it's a, a focused on an urban setting or rural, rural, I mean, rural setting or urban, it's the same idea. It's just what to expect after year one, after year five, after, you know, it's not going to recover for 10 years. So yeah, I think I agree. Yeah, actually, Josh, that'd be a fun that would be a fun thing to do. If we had people that were interested, we could almost create a format. So right now, River Shirt has a YouTube channel. I don't even know exactly what that means, uh, but I was told that. Uh, but I guess it's kind of like UHF with Weird Al Yankovic. But um, we could uh, we could kind of have a general format, and then maybe we have different. Uh, river share members in different areas that say, okay, well, this is what it looks like in an urban channel in this region. And we would just post that on there and then people could link to it and say, okay, this is kind of some of the maintenance issues and this is what we expect to happen. And this is the short term maintenance. Well, kind of well, like, turn, sorry, go ahead, Josh. I was going to just uh, adding on, David, before Ed and Mike, you were on the uh, earlier call that we talked about just getting. Uh, source material from other people and making that a linkage. You're right. If we lay out a format and say, hey, you want to feature a project that you think looks cool, you know, put a dot on a map where it is and, uh, you know, a, 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 you know, a short uh, project description so people can see the before after, you know, maybe one or two highlights. I, I don't know. It'd be, a, it'd be an opportunity to a, appeal to some of the commercial interests by featuring projects, but also, uh, you know, also being a good resource for, for, for interested parties as well, or, or a resource for, for us to, to share with other landowners, say, hey, look at River Shared, you can see a lot of different examples. 
Yeah, Josh, if you if you think about it, like um, I'll try to think about it a little bit too. But if we if anybody else is interested too, but uh, you know, what would it look like? I mean, because obviously a slide even the size that I had today probably isn't that di that digestible for landowners. But you know, would it be a a couple would it be a couple minute uh, YouTube thing uh, where we just emphasize some key points? Would it be uh, some sort of a document that we hand out as Alan had mentioned. Um, so yeah, it's a great idea. Well, another, another thing we could do is on some of these longer, these, these sites that are, have some length to them that, that may uh, um, extend over a couple construction seasons and then we get a, a big banger that comes through while the project's under construction and you can demonstrate for the same storm event. You know, if you're to say, assume you're working upstream to downstream, um, how the upstream section that had a growing season under, under its belt, how it responded versus say the lower sections under construction right now are recently constructed that doesn't have the same response to create, um, to affect how the, the river, I mean, it doesn't have the same vegetation response to provide some resilience and how those two sections respond differently just to demonstrate, look, this is the exact same approach. The only reason it's didn't, it hasn't worked here yet is because we don't have the, the, vegetation in place to provide that resistance against shear stresses. But up here, I mean, the geometry is the same, right? It's just the lack of vegetation from one section to another. And that's largely what causes um, some of the damage that, when we get these big events at first is just because we just don't have the, the root matrix in place yet to provide some of that resistance. So um, maybe we just collectively keep our eye out for a project that that happens on and go out there and get some photos and maybe some video and just, and It'd probably be a good talk at a conference too, just just to convey the message that um, you know the, these these things are, are, as Alan said, they're at their most vulnerable state. You know, when we walk off the site, so um, I think something like that might be helpful. I I I totally agree, Mike. It most definitely would, and I, you know, I think there has to be some real discussion sometimes. You know, work in the summer and the and the southeast is, is a really good time to do the work we deal with trout moratorium and in, in some of the locations but um you know when you're waiting several months to do your bigger root plantings and doing those things you know you just extend that period of vulnerability and you know that's some real discussions i think we need to to, to look at and, and take with some folks of how we manage that we've also noticed that um, we've got to really take a look outside the stream corridor and make sure that we're not impacted by a lot of um, overland flow. Uh, some of our projects where landowners have had the, um, some of the bigger concerns is uh, overland flow that comes down, you know, towards the stream corridor part that um, either just didn't maybe get noticed or paid enough attention that, hey, Here's where a low area drops down and drains towards our stream corridor and we get a big rainfall event. It's going to cause a gully to come down, you know, headed back to the stream. And uh, just looking at all of those aspects makes a big difference as well. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, I hope everybody has a great week. If anybody uh, has something you want to talk about technically um, uh, or uh, from an inspiration standpoint, just shoot me an email and we'll get you on the we'll get you on the list. Uh, we're going to be trying to technically talk about a project once a month. Uh, so somebody can do a case study once a month and then uh, also talk about a different structure type once a month. This this month we talked about cross veins. Uh, probably uh, the next structure will be uh, J hooks uh, for uh, next month. So uh, 